Welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. Usually I do a show every two weeks, and yet this week I'm doing a second show. And why I'm doing it should be obvious based on the topic, which is flourishing during a pandemic. This is a show about human flourishing and the the quest to flourish as individuals, and we're now in an incredibly difficult time for that. There is a combination of pandemic, and now that's that's a term that can be used to be more scary than it is, but there's a lot scary about what's going on, both in terms of the virus and in terms of the different reactions to it. But then at the same time, and very related, there is a at least the beginning of a recession, and you're seeing huge declines in the stock market, among other negative signs. And so I thought I would just share a few thoughts about how I think some of the ideas on this show can be applied to the attempt to not only survive during this difficult situation, but to flourish. Before I get into it, I have four specific ideas that I'm applying and that may work for you as well, but I thought I would just say something about the general news environment that that we're in and the commentary environment in the initial episodes of the show, I talked about the knowledge system, you know, which I think of as the set of institutions and processes that give us access or not to the best knowledge of specialists in, in different fields. And I think the knowledge system is really being illustrated to be not very good on this issue. It's very hard to find clear thinking on this issue. It's hard to know what to believe. And one thing that I've particularly noticed is that there's a devaluing. There is kind of with the coronavirus, I see two kinds of things. One is coronavirus 19, to I guess be more precise. One thing is people just saying, you know, this is the end of the world. We have to do everything we can to stop it. And then other people saying, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's overrated. And even sometimes doing reckless things like touching surfaces and saying, oh, I'll be totally okay. But what I see missing is even if there are real risks to this, and clearly uh, there are, we really need to take seriously any kind of disruption of normal life, uh, particularly given that millions and millions of people's livelihood depends on in-person human interaction or situations where we are in close proximity to other human beings. And unfortunately, what, I, what I've seen, one thing that, that bothers me is even from some of the people I think are helping with rational thought on the potential severity of the threat, I see a, a devaluing of what it costs people to engage in what is often called extreme social distancing. And I think it's particular I find it particularly annoying when it's from people who are pretty wealthy and who already work in easily virtualized fields. And so they can say things like, oh well, yeah, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to hang out at home. Or there is even somebody, I won't name the person who was kind of prominent on this issue, who had uh, pictures of social distancing involving her kids on a very nice beach that was virtually empty. And somebody commented, this is not a scalable solution for 330 million people. So I think it makes sense, from what I know, for a lot of people to engage in social distancing. Uh, I am, but I, th- I think we really need I, what I really want, and and I'm finding hard to get, is people with a framework and policy proposals who truly value human life and human flourishing, and who aren't just on the standard of oh, let's minimize virus at all costs, let's minimize this risk at all costs, but can see it in the big picture, including what are the risks, what are the damages to human life of restricting our interaction with others. So that's a subject I hope to have more to say on in a future episode, and I would like to be able to bring on an expert or two that I think is really good and to help flesh that this issue out with them. And maybe somebody who's an expert more on the philosophical side of it, and certainly somebody who's an expert on the viral slash pandemic uh, side of it. So there's a whole issue of what's the best human flourishing policy culturally and politically, and I'm really interested in that. I'm super interested in any anyone you think is making good recommendations about that. 
And if, if you have any, certainly email me at alex at alexepstein.com. But now I want to talk about, okay, what can we do as individuals? And it's it's a very difficult situation. And there's a combination of, I mean, it can be fear if if you are particularly vulnerable, if you're elderly, or if you're immunocompromised, as they say, or if you're close to people who are in that situation, like physically close, what do you do? And so that those fears are known, I think, less appreciated by some of the people I was criticizing before is just the kind of financial stress that this is putting people under, people who are connected, for example, to events in the very broadest sense, you know, any kind of in-person interaction. And I, I you know, I'm in an interesting situation. I, I feel fortunate in, in many ways compared to a lot of people, but I do have a business where one of our major revenue sources is speaking events, live speaking events. So imagine what's happened to that business. You know, that's that has people canceling events. And so uh, revenue I was counting on, income I was counting on uh, to come in as I performed at different events, you know, that is that often it's delayed, but it can be delayed very significantly. And then you can imagine uh, virtually no one is booking new uh, events and then I also happen to do a lot of work, both my speaking work and my consulting work, because I'm in energy, and I'm particularly interested in in fossil fuels. And I have much, uh, those who listen to the show know I have much more positive views than most people about fossil fuels and how they contribute to human flourishing. I have a lot of business in the oil and gas industry, which I'm generally supportive of, and that industry, uh, in part related to coronavirus, in part related to other things, completely crashed earlier this week. So that's, uh, again, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to arouse sympathy at all. There are many people in much more difficult circumstances than I am. But certainly, if I wasn't already aware of what recession and fear of a virus can do to people, I am certainly very, very aware of what that is is like. And so it can be very, very distracting to be wondering about, okay, what's going to happen? And I find there's an issue of stress and related, there's the issue of reactivity. So here are a couple of tactics that I'm using that I hope are useful to you as well. So tactic one is elicit the relaxation response. And there's a lot more on this. If you look at one of the recent episodes on meditation, I talked about the relaxation response. But if you just get the book, The Relaxation Response, it's trying to get at the principle that makes meditation, specifically what's called transcendental meditation, work very well. And it's the, the, the theory behind it is that just as you have a fight or flight response, so that that really can wreak havoc on your system. So you have a relaxation response that can make your system heal and be much more resilient. And this is the kind of time when it's particularly good to go overboard on that. And most people usually go underboard on it. So it can be meditation. But if you check out that book, it also has other ways that you can do it. In in recent weeks, I, I recommended the Flow Meditation course by James Brown. So that would be one way of doing it. I think it's... I think it's flowmeditation.co. You can check out the other episode. But I'm just say familiarizing yourself with that and figuring out a way to elicit the relaxation response. Number two is create a distraction-free work setup. So I'm finding in my own case, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, that there is just an extreme temptation to want to know kind of up to the minute stuff on what's happening with coronavirus, but also the human response to coronavirus. And then if you're in any kind of exceptional, often exceptionally difficult work situation, then there's also all kinds of reactivity. So just in, in my own case, there's just a bunch of different things I'm doing right now for the business that aren't that aren't the same as my usual day to day because I'm trying to come up with different kinds of creative solutions to things, alternate you know alternate sources of income, and just do do it just very focused on things. And sometimes there are this involves interacting with people very very quickly, so it's easy to get just in email all the time and responding back and forth to people uh, on email. And so I th what I found is super helpful in terms of creating a distraction-free work setup is if you can, 
figure out how to create a distraction-free work device. So in my case, I have, and I'm not advocating going and buying new things, but I have an i an iPod, and it only has things where I input into it. It doesn't really have things that other people are giving me inputs. The one exception is text messages, which my assistant can message me at and certain other people can, but I don't find that anywhere near as distracting as email. But besides that, it's just things like my calendar, word processor, uh, you know, web browser, but I'm using that for something called Checkfist, which is outlining software I really like. And so I just find that when I'm on, and, and I have the same setup on my, uh, I have an iPad that's just set up as an Alex input device. And I just find that getting on that just makes me much more proactive. So instead of you know being in email and reacting to things, I can be much more proactive in thinking about strategies or even if I even if I need to write an email, it'll be okay, I'll write it on my input device and then send it from a different device later. So I, I just find that to be a lifesaver because it's so you know, changes in conditions like this, it can just be so easy to subject oneself to an overwhelming number of inputs that don't actually add up to anything and just lead to a really unhealthy level of, of stimulation uh, and external stimulation. The third tactic is, I'm using this terminology from a guy I'm a f fan of, Sam Ovens, which is plan tomorrow today. So this is really make an effort to calendar the next day with as much specificity as possible. And this helps with the distractions because if I know, hey, this is what I'm doing tomorrow, and part of it I've talked about in the past about having comprehensiveness with your calendar is making sure that that you've looked through everything that you might want to do and then chosen among those things. And so then you can enter the next day and say, okay, this is all I need to do today. I don't need to worry about am I am I forgetting something? And then I also don't need to worry about distracting myself. If I need to look up the news, then I can set myself one or more times to do that. Or if I need to go and email, I can set up myself one or more times to do that. But I don't want to get up and be super uh, distracted by that. So with both the the distraction-free work setup and plan tomorrow today, these are very good habits in general, but they're particularly necessary and require a little extra effort to enforce in these you know, incredibly high distraction, sometimes high stress environment. And then the fourth is, and I don't mean to be, I don't know, I, people might take this the wrong way, and I don't want to trivialize things at all, particularly if you're sick or you're around someone who's sick, but use, use the challenges as a growth opportunity. And so one way of thinking of it is, how can I, how can I learn uh, how can I, you know, learn valuable lessons and then apply them to make uh, permanent positive changes? And so it'll, you know, this what this amounts to will vary based on your experience. But I think about okay with business, if it, you know, if I have business challenges with it, I think about okay, well, how what can I learn to make my business more resilient in the uh, in the future? How can I? And that's that's a super kind of valuable lesson. And so I think one can think about this with whether you have a business or not, whether you have a job. If you're feeling insecure, you can think about, okay, well, how can I how can I make myself more secure in the future so that I'm, you know, build up a war chest, maybe spend less in the present and and save more in the future and just think about, okay, what what will really be enjoyable in the present, but also how can I set up in effect a war chest so I have many, many months at least of income that I can draw from and so I can handle different kinds of disruptions. And that's the kind of thing that's, it's harder for us to do today because we haven't had these kinds of crises, but that say people who grew up during the depression, one benefit of that is they often developed very good financial habits. So that's just one kind of example. Uh, another kind of example is just appreciation of life. I find it, I think it's a really noble and difficult thing to sufficiently appreciate being alive because we're not alive for very long and we don't really have the contrast. We didn't, we weren't alive when we weren't alive. So we don't know what it's like not to be alive. And I don't think we'll know what it's like to be not alive when we're not alive. But it's, there's, I think there's always this challenge of, okay, it's so great that whatever else is going on, it's so great to be alive. How do we appreciate that? And a situation like this, I think when just you might just have the experience when you're just you're thinking about coronavirus all day and then you just go out and you see something beautiful and you think, wow, this, 
it's amazing to be alive. And it is still in so many ways amazing to be alive during this situation. And one aspect of it that connects a lot to my work on energy is just how fortunate we are to live in what I would call an empowered world, which is a world where we have machines to make us incomparably more productive. If, if you look at coronavirus, this applies in two major dimensions. So one is that all the hospitals and medical facilities are just incredibly uh, amplified as too weak. You know, they're just completely made possible by low-cost machine power. They themselves are just full of all of these life-sustaining machines, including breathing machines. But then also, the only reason we can afford all this infrastructure is because we had low-cost machine power to produce everything in the hospitals and medical facilities, including the facilities themselves. And then on top of that, the reason that we have the time that so many people can be specialists in this field, that we can have these amazing medical people, is because low-cost machine power has made us so productive at the basics in life, including food, clothing, shelter, water, that we have, you know, that, that human beings can spend huge amounts of time on other activities, including practicing and innovating in modern medicine. So maybe that's a helpful kind of perspective. It's certainly one that, that I think from given my work and energy, but more broadly, it's amazing to be alive and it's it's amazing to be alive today. And there's there's lots to criticize in the way things are being handled. And it's really, it's tough going through any kind of recession. And it's, it's tough being afraid of a virus, and in my case, being afraid of people's reaction to the virus, even more than I'm afraid of the virus. So I think, but, but to then be able to cultivate appreciation in this situation, I think will enable me to appreciate better times as well. And I think a lot of enjoyment of life is, is internal in the sense of the perspective one takes on what's happening, including one's own actions and being able to appreciate one's own actions, but also appreciate the good things about the state of the world that we're fortunate enough to live in. So those are some examples of using it as a growth opportunity. Okay, that's it for this week. I just wanted to record a very quick episode because I'm sure this is on people's minds and I thought a show on human flourishing should have something to say about flourishing during difficult times, including a pandemic. So I hope that all the listeners stay safe and healthy from the virus and also safe from some of the reactions to the virus. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can send them to alex at alexepstein.com. If you want to participate in a discussion, then you can go to facebook.com slash human flourishing project and to get on the email list to get... Uh, notifications about when new episodes come out, go to humanflourishingproject.com. And of course, you can also subscribe on iTunes and all kinds of other podcast platforms. That's it for this week. Wishing that you the best of luck in surviving and flourishing in the coming weeks. I'll be back uh, within two weeks, uh, might even be sooner. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been the Human Flourishing Project.